exaggeration to say that there is a world before Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, the world after Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. Oppenheimer's reaction to when the first nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were mixed. There was obviously a professional pride that this project that he had masterminded had paid off. But at the same time, what he was aware of, that everything he had created was causing death on a monumental scale. I have been asked whether in the years to come it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night. I am afraid that the answer to that question is yes. I don't think uh, there's been an event in human history that's quite so consequential, because what you showed with that was that man was capable of not just destroying each other on a small human scale, but capable of wiping out the world. On the 22nd of August 1939, Albert Einstein and Leo Slizard sent a letter to the 32nd President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The two scientists warned Roosevelt that the Germans were harboring uranium sources for research into nuclear fission, which could lead to the creation of highly destructive bombs. This letter would soon change the very course of the world. At the time of its delivery, Europe was on the verge of chaos. Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler sat at the helm of Germany, infecting his citizens with hate and division. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland, triggering a declaration of war from Britain and France under the 1918 Treaty of Versailles. Within six weeks, the German army crushed Poland, executing thousands of citizens in the process. A dark cloud soon loomed over Europe. Sure I am that this day, now, we are the masters of our fate. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. You've got to remember that America does not enter the Second World War until two years after it's broken out. Of course, it starts in September 1939, uh, when Britain declares war on Germany because Germany has invaded Poland. And so for two years, 
There has been fighting in Europe. Hitler invades countries like France and the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, Hitler tries to invade the United Kingdom. You've then got Hitler in the middle of 1941 invading the Soviet Union. That's a big event. So, you know, war is basically waging worldwide. By the end of 1941, America had been neutral. I mean, in practice, it was supplying aid to Britain in every way it could because President Roosevelt was more, he was more than just a supporter. He was somebody who actually saw that the only way of having any kind of peace in the world was by defeating the Nazis and, and the Axis powers. What he also saw was to involve America in another war it would have been politically catastrophic and people were not engaged in it and they didn't want that. So he was very, very cautious about any kind of action that would actually lead America into declaring war. And even though he'd said to the King, King George VI, a couple of years before, if the Nazis would start bombing London, we would come in on your side. There was still a great reluctance to actually take the, fur the further step that would lead to such a commitment. And obviously that changed when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. It was not until 1941 that the conflict spread beyond Europe's borders. In the December, Japan launched a surprise attack on US naval base Pearl Harbor. The military strike killed over 2,400 people and destroyed 19 US Navy ships. The reason why it was so symbolic and so successful was that America had never been attacked like that on their home shores, especially in the modern era. And it was proof that the Japanese were this highly mechanized force, utterly ruthless, who could commit an act like this of absolute audacity and absolute violence. As his citizens mourned, FDR retaliated fast, declaring war on Japan and bringing the US into the most destructive conflict in history. That the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Although under no obligation, Germany and Italy also joined Japan's side, whilst the US gained support from Hitler's enemies, Britain and the Soviet Union. It's one of Hitler's most perplexing decisions as to why he decided to declare war uh, on the United States. But actually his reason for doing it is because he thinks finally this is an opportunity to show that he really wants to rid the world of what he sees as being the evils of international finance and, and Jewish control of economies. Of course, he's dead wrong about that. He's also in a pact with Japan, so he feels that Japan's a natural ally. And so this is why, you know, war breaks out. It's Hitler saber-rattling. He doesn't know what it's going to lead to. In the summer of 1942, FDR approved the creation of the Manhattan Project, bringing together research scientists and military engineers from across the US and Canada. The birth of the atomic bomb finally commenced. The Manhattan Project has got lots of different roles, if you like. The primary role, of course, is to build a nuclear bomb that you can use, you know, in the war. Some of the other roles are also to try and establish what level of nuclear capacity do other countries have? And of course, especially Nazi Germany. 
And of course, the Manhattan Project is also there to construct all the stuff around to build a nuclear bomb. So it's got to mastermind factories. It's got a mastermind getting hold of uranium. It's got a mastermind creating plutonium. So it's got lots and lots of different roles. And this is gonna take place initially, you know, masterminded from Manhattan, hence the name, but it's gonna take place in locations all over the United States, all the way through to California and even in Canada. General Leslie Groves of the Manhattan Engineer District commanded the project. A hard-headed leader with an intensity often feared by his inferiors, Groves stopped at nothing to make the mission a success. To many people's surprise, Groves put forward J. Robert Oppenheimer for lead physicist, a notably contentious figure. Oppenheimer lacked a Nobel Prize. He preferred theoretical science over practical, he was politically left-leaning, often attending Communist Front activities and even going on to marry a member of the Communist Party. Oppenheimer's political activities and Oppenheimer's uh, political sympathies actually drew the attention of the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, and actually, he had his uh, phone tapped, he had his mail opened, he was watched, he was followed. Um, you know, obviously he was in an incredibly sensitive position and the fact that he had loyalties that may lie elsewhere outside the United States, of course, could have been considered a problem. He soon became the US's greatest chance of building an atomic bomb before the Germans. But even though Groves wasn't a genius, his single act of genius, the one thing he really gets right is to appoint Oppenheimer. The most secretive project in US history took place in Los Alamos, New Mexico, an isolated desert region where Oppenheimer's team would never be disturbed. There were very, very few people working on the Manhattan Project that knew what was happening. You know, people who were doing the laundry were given these weird devices that they had to, you know, rub over the clothes and to see how many clicks this device meant. Now, those people had no idea what they were doing, but of course today we know those are Geiger counters which are measuring levels of radiation. So, you know, people were aware there was a lot of weird stuff going on uh, in all the locations of the Manhattan Project, especially Los Alamos in New Mexico. Both Groves and Oppenheimer's scientists set out to create nuclear chain reactions using uranium-235 and plutonium-239, two rare isotopes which needed huge levels of funding to procure. I think there was also a sense that America wanted to be top dog in terms of its technology and its research. It wanted to be this, this country that was dominant because obviously at this stage, Germany was seen as, as a threat. It wasn't Russia or Britain or anywhere else. And it's very much a race against time as to who was going to be the first to harness this energy and to come out on top. Three years into the project, the scientists had created two new bombs named Little Boy and Fat Man. Little Boy had the simpler design. The gun-shaped bomb triggered a nuclear explosion by firing one piece of uranium-235 into another, causing a chain reaction. Fat Man was in turn the more complex of the two, a bulbous 10-foot bomb containing a sphere of metal plutonium-239 it was surrounded by blocks of explosives that were designed to produce an extremely accurate implosion. However, the high risk and high cost of Fat Man made the Los Alamos scientists feel uneasy. And so, Oppenheimer's team insisted on a test run. Minus 30 seconds. Minus 20 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Five 
there was a big worry that actually by triggering a nuclear explosion, you might cause the entire atmosphere to burn up. And if that happened, that would be the end of the world. Now, even though many scientists didn't think that was going to happen, there were a few who were just a little bit worried about it. So in fact, when that first bomb does go off, <laughs> there's a relief in some ways that the world hasn't exploded along with it. Oppenheimer was the American Prometheus because he was this man who had this enormous power and he was frightened of it because when he saw the test, he said, I am become death destroyer of worlds. And I think that's a very powerful thing to say. The entire Trinity test was not just for fun, it was leading to what was going to become probably the most single notorious act of the 20th century. The Trinity test succeeded, and onlookers finally realized the enormity of the bomb's power. The Allied powers secured victory in Europe in May 1945. The Nazi Empire finally fell after six long years, and Hitler escaped to his bunker to die by cyanide. However, for the United States, the war was not over yet. Trouble still brewed in the Pacific, and American blood continued to spill. After VE Day was declared in Europe, there was a real problem that America and the rest of the Allied powers were still at war with Japan. And Japan showed absolutely no signs of surrendering. The difference between Germany and Japan was that Germany, especially after Hitler died, knew they were beaten, knew there was nowhere else to go. They just basically had to settle for a humiliating peace, the best possible terms they could get. The thing about Japan is that there is no concept of surrender in their national identity. But the whole idea was that they would literally fight until the last man. When Japan and the United States are fighting this war in the Pacific, what they're doing is fighting for island strongholds. You've got to think of the war as like a kind of to and froing uh, of trying to grab stepping stones on a big pond, if you like. And so, you know, the more stepping stones you control, the more of the pond you control. And so you have huge battles on islands like Iwo Jima, um, uh, Peleliu, uh, which are very bloody, very attritional fights in which the Japanese are often dug in and fight to the last man. And it costs an enormous amount of lives. So it's a very bloody, very vicious, very drawn out combat. And of course, as well as these battles on these small islands, you also have these huge naval engagements as well, like the Battle of Midway, which again are very costly in men and material. President Roosevelt passed away a month before the Nazi regime's defeat. Harry S. Truman assumed the role of president, only learning of the Manhattan Project's existence 24 hours into the job. The major task of leading the world to peace now landed in Truman's hands. Roosevelt was a very sober man. He understood that what they were dealing with was something of absolute magnitude and so therefore his idea and i think he was absolutely right was that as few people knew about this as possible and in fact truman was at one point before he was aware of the manhattan project he was seeing all these documents which seemed to be this vast government expense and he didn't understand why people were spending so much money on this secret project he tried to look into it but he was informed very sternly no this is not for you and so obviously in the context of war, there are so many things that you're not involved with, he just let it go. But of course, after Roosevelt died and when he became president, he became aware of what was the greatest scientific endeavor that America had ever been involved in. On the 26th of July, 1945, Allied leaders gathered at the Potsdam Conference in Berlin to draw up plans for Japan's surrender. 
President Truman, alongside Britain and China, issued the document. The Potsdam Declaration that was made at the Potsdam Conference said to Japan, listen, you have got to surrender um, and, and without any conditions whatsoever. You know, this has got to be a complete defeat. Otherwise, you know, hell is going to be rained down on your country. What Truman, the American president, didn't do was to reveal, actually, I've got a big ace up my sleeve, and that's an atom bomb, but he hinted at it. The Potsdam Declaration gave the Japanese an ultimatum, accept defeat or suffer incomprehensible destruction. Japan showed no sign of bowing down. Prime Minister Suzuki announced that the Japanese policy towards the declaration was one of mokusatu, killing with silence. From that moment, the dropping of the atomic bomb was inevitable. At 8.15 a.m. on the 6th of August, 1945, the lead plane Enola Gay released the little boy bomb over Hiroshima. Residents awoke to the most almighty sight in human history. Little Boy fell almost six miles in 43 seconds before detonating at an altitude of 2,000 feet. 80,000 people died instantly, some even evaporating on the spot. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. You can imagine that if you are in Hiroshima, you're going about your, your daily business, there's just this flash of blinding white light, and then all of a sudden everything around you is destroyed. And it is something biblical. I mean, you would have genuinely imagined, if you'd seen it, that this was the end of days. Japan, at this point, was faced with the fact that one of their major in industrial and military bases no longer existed. I mean, a huge number of civilians had been killed. It was an act completely without parallel in modern warfare. It's something, it was literally the first atomic bomb. You would have expected that they would have thought, we can't carry on. But this is Japan we're talking about. This isn't any other country. And so they refused to surrender on the grounds that their attitude was, well, you can keep bombing us. We don't care. We are not going to surrender to you. But of course, the problem is they didn't really understand what they were up against. The bomb obliterated Hiroshima and its people. And yet, the Japanese government still refused to surrender. Three days later, a second bomb landed on Nagasaki. The devastation uh, at Nagasaki is, you know, make no mistake, it's huge. But because Nagasaki is built in sort of valleys and it's got cliffs and things like that, the explosion was much more contained. So relatively less 
fewer parts of the city were destroyed compared to Hiroshima, but still you have a death toll, you know, approaching 100,000 people. You know, it is still devastating and it is far greater um, than any other single bomb can possibly produce. Emperor Hirohito broke the government's deadlock, expressing that the Japanese race will be destroyed if the war continues. And so, on the 15th of August, Hirohito announced the end to Japan's suffering over radio broadcast. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Reporters rush out to relay the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country. A new wave of cruelty and devastation ended the conflict. Japan officially signed the Surrender Act soon after. Relief spread across the United States. The Second World War was over. Fathers, brothers and sons could come home again. But what exactly did this new power mean for America? The reaction in the United States was, was one largely of jubilation. Uh, you know, hang on a minute, you know, we've got this amazing new weapon that no one really quite understood yet. All they knew was one bomb could do the job of months and months of bombing in just one second. Um, so it meant, obviously, immense source of national pride. It also meant an immense source of relief because, of course, what those two A-bombs led to was the Japanese surrender just a few days later. War was over, and who was not going to be happy about that? What was very interesting about American public reaction to atomic bomb was that it was sold exceptionally well by Truman. But Truman managed to, com to convince them in such a way that if the atomic bomb hadn't been launched, talking about a vastly prolonged war, vastly more people dying, so it was actually almost unanimous public support for it. The dropping of the atomic bomb destroyed the traditional competition between offensive and defensive warfare methods. No amount of blockades or shelters could shield citizens from the bomb's fury and rage. The Americans had ultimate control over the most feared weapon on Earth. No one could stand in their way. I don't think Fire has been an event in human history that's quite so consequential because what you showed with that was that man was capable of not just destroying each other on, on a small human scale, but capable of wiping out the world. It was also a sign, as if you'd ever been needed to have it, that we were not anymore in this old fashioned war of guns and of military invasions and stuff. It was this new, much more terrifying world that was ahead of people. These devices were just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And actually, the devastation we see at Hiroshima and at Nagasaki it, it is tiny compared to what nuclear weapons would shortly be capable of delivering. Science has profoundly altered the conditions of man's life, both materially and in ways of the spirit as well. It has extended the range of questions in which man has a choice. It has extended man's freedom to make significant decisions. It's easy to think that the story of the Manhattan Project ends in August 1945. However, that's far from the case. It's not an exaggeration to say that there is a world before Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, and a world after Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. The monopoly over atomic weapons placed serious strain on America's relationship with Stalin. A new era of diplomatic tensions burst open at the seams. The use of the atomic bomb in, in the theater of war was something that I think America was perfectly prepared to do. 
And the fact that it was done in this context in World War II was essentially the way of ending the war and also of showcasing American might. We can also see that it was a way of showing that Stalin and the Soviet Union, who were very much intent on making their own atomic bomb, we have this power, we have this weapon. If you seek to emulate us, essentially we got here first. The Soviets and Americans faced each other in a state of neither war nor peace, and yet the push of one button could have led to total global destruction. The Soviet Union's development of nuclear weapons was vastly behind that of the United States. But what the Soviet Union did have uh, were spies working in the Manhattan Project uh, and taking that information, ultimately relaying it back to Moscow. And so you have a, a, a spy who was actually employed by the British, he was a physicist called Klaus Fuchs, and he came to work in the United States on the Manhattan Project, and he was giving as much information as he could to the Soviet Union. Now, what information from people like Fuchs did was ultimately to shorten by a year or two how long it took the Russians to develop the nuclear bomb. The Cold War continued right up to the late 80s, over 40 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Europe suffered division once again, and a nuclear arms race conquered political discourse. Well, because of the existence of the atomic bomb, what would have, I think, been a conventional World War III between America and the Soviet Union became a Cold War instead. Neither side wanted to go about creating what was known as mutually assured destruction. And while you have this immense power and you have this immense ability to destroy your enemy, there was also the absolute certainty that whoever's going to blink first is going to be the one who's going to be in trouble. The Cold War would have happened without nuclear weapons, but it just made the stakes feel so much higher. I have been asked whether in the years to come it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night. I'm afraid that the answer to that question is yes. In the aftermath of World War II, the US Congress transferred the Manhattan Project's assets to a new agency, the Atomic Energy Commission. Oppenheimer took on the role of president of the General Advisory Committee of the AEC. However, from his new role sprang a commitment to nuclear disarmament and control a debate many nuclear scientists found themselves drawn to during the Cold War era. Oppenheimer's reaction to when the first nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were mixed. Uh, there was obviously a professional pride that this project that he had masterminded against the clock, vast expense, long hours, had paid off. But at the same time, what he was aware of, that everything he created was causing death on a monumental scale. So, you know, you couldn't help but be human, but feel very mixed about that. If there is another world war, this civilization may go under. We need to ask ourselves whether we're doing all we can to avert that. We need, I think, to learn to understand the realities of life abroad, not so much in terms of slogans, 
as in terms of the lives of men. In our response to these realities, there is hope for peace. Oppenheimer was a leading voice in wanting arms control. He knew uh, that uh, nuclear Armageddon, you know, could be imminent if there was going to be a huge nuclear arms race uh, between the world's superpowers. So he actually, ironically, despite being the father in many ways of the atom bomb, spent much of his time subsequently speaking out against it. Certainly he was somebody who, after the war and after the launch, was somebody who was I think he was mistrusted because he didn't seem to be positive about what he'd done. He seemed to be rather racked with guilt because ultimately it doesn't matter how much of a scientific breakthrough it is, there are consequences. And Oppenheimer knew from and he was terrified of them. In 1954, these views, coupled with his political convictions, led him to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities during the so-called witch hunt promoted by Senator McCarthy. The committee is determined that the hearing shall be fair and impartial. We have subpoenaed witnesses representing both sides of the question. All we are after are the facts. After the war, you have uh, the establishment of all sorts of committees that are investigating whether people have been loyal to the Soviet Union, acted as Soviet agents. Uh, it was considered that if you really were a member of the Communist Party, you were un-American, you were a de facto traitor. And in fact, Oppenheimer, despite proving his loyalty to the United States by constructing for them the world's first atomic weapon that, that ended the war and arguably saved hundreds of thousands of lives, he was still hauled up by committees and asked to justify himself. So you have this situation in which eventually Oppenheimer's security clearance is revoked because he's considered to be a threat to national security. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I think he had a, probably enough humility to know that even if he wasn't involved, it still would have happened. You know, the nuclear physics was there, the money was there, the nuclear bomb would have been built. So I think Oppenheimer knew that ultimately, you know, his place in history was being there at the right place at the right time. The legacy of the Manhattan Project is immense. The advent of nuclear weapons not only brought an end to the largest war in history, but also ushered in an atomic age and a defining era of big science. Research into nuclear physics you know, has both been hugely beneficial for mankind. So, you know, the, the understanding how the atom works, of course, has created, uh, you know, forms of scanning technology, which have been brilliant for medicine, nuclear power, which is arguably the greenest power source on the planet. You, you've got all sorts of uh, developments that have been very beneficial for mankind. However, in the years following Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the world's two superpowers, America and Russia, entered a race to nuclear domination, peaking in the 1980s. Countries which have, you know, a nuclear capability um, feel that they're carrying a very big stick indeed. It gives them an enormous amount of negotiating power. It gives them an enormous amount of potential power in any conflict to say, look, we've always got the big one, so watch out for us.
The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 symbolized a new era for world peace. With the West and East united once again, many thought the years ahead would bring an age of nuclear compromise and calm. And for a time, they did. Nuclear stockpiles peaked in 1986 and steadied off from the 1990s onwards. The appetite to produce more warheads declined. Nevertheless, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 brought fears of nuclear obliteration to the surface once again. The current tension between the West and Russia is merely a new phase in a Cold War that never ended. I think at the moment we're probably closer to a nuclear war than we have been since the Second World War. It's what's been interesting over the last two and a half decades, when you watch how Russia has changed in terms of our acceptance of them, it's gone from being a slightly chaotic country that's nonetheless broadly on our side to being our enemy. And I think we can certainly see Putin as public enemy number one. And it's terrifying, really, that we all go about our daily business. And there is this man not so very far from us with his finger on this trigger. And if he pulls the trigger, our lives as we know will cease to exist. Russia is, I think, the greatest threat to world peace. Um, and I think the fact that you know, Russia has a nuclear capability is worrying. But it's had a nuclear capability in one way or another since 1949, uh, and it's never yet used one I in any conflict. So, you know, we just got to keep our fingers crossed. The birth of the atomic bomb changed the world forever. In the years before the Manhattan Project, a weapon of such power was not even remotely imaginable to most people on Earth. And yet, with war comes new inventions, new ways of destroying the enemy, new machines to wipe out human life. You know, we have potentially got the power now to literally destroy the world. The destruction in Japan has left a mark on every generation since 1945. There isn't a person alive today who does not fear a repeat of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As the only country to have experienced a nuclear attack, Japan stands firm in stating that human beings and nuclear weapons cannot coexist. A profound belief in a world gripped by the nuclear age. I think we've all seen the pictures of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've all seen exactly what nuclear weapons do. I think for anybody like Putin or anybody else in the world who's ever tempted to think about, oh, this might further my own personal heroism or whatever else, you should take a look at those pictures and think very hard about what they're about to do because there are no heroes in this ultimately. You know ultimately that all that is going to do is lead to untold devastation and untold destruction. We cannot predict the future. But if one thing is for certain, the threat of nuclear war hangs heavy over the human race, now more than ever.